This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during August. This month, we'll track down four planets before dawn, have some fun with new moons, peek at some Perseids, welcome Saturn to the evening sky, and gaze at the center of our galaxy. So, load up on the bug juice and come along on this month's Sky Tour. As an avid stargazer, I'm keenly aware of the sun's risings and settings as the seasons change. For example, here in Boston, getting a full night's sleep can be a real challenge in midsummer. The birds start serenading me by 4 a.m., and sunlight streams into my east-facing bedroom by 5. Ugh! But now it's August, and daybreak comes an hour or so later. So I might be tempted to get up early to watch what's going on in the sky before dawn. If you need convincing to join me during August, there'll be four planets in the pre-dawn sky, and the two brightest will be putting on quite a show. Here's what you can look forward to seeing. By now, Jupiter has risen high enough to be well clear of the eastern horizon by dawn's first light. It joins dazzling Venus, which has dominated the pre-dawn sky for the past couple of months. As August begins, these two beacons are separated by about the width of your clenched fist held at arm's length, with Venus higher up. But not for long. Venus has sped past Earth in its orbit and is heading behind the Sun, so consequently it's drifting lower in the morning sky, even as Jupiter inches a little higher day by day. This all comes to a spectacular culmination on the morning of August 12th, when the year's most anticipated planet pairing takes place. These two will be separated by less than one degree, about the width of your outstretched little finger. You won't have any trouble figuring out which one is which, because Venus outshines Jupiter by two full magnitudes, or more than six times. In the mornings thereafter, Venus slides closer to the horizon, and Jupiter keeps climbing. They'll be about seven degrees apart a week later, and roughly one fist apart by month's end. But don't worry. Venus will linger in view before dawn until at least early November. Meanwhile, while we're all agog and distracted with Venus and Jupiter, watch for Mercury sneaking up from the eastern horizon by mid-month. It's farthest from the sun in the sky on the 19th, so you should be able to spot it easily about 45 minutes before sunrise for about a week before and after the 19th. To the right of all this planet action, Look for Orion rising majestically, his outstretched arm leading the way. Look for the distinctive vertical trio of stars that mark his belt, with Betelgeuse to their left and Rigel to their right. Orion is joined by Procyon and Sirius lower down, marking the hunter's dogs, and by Capella and Aldebaran higher up. Castor and Pollux in Gemini are just to the left of Jupiter. What a traffic jam! And on several successive mornings, from August 17th to the 21st, the waning crescent moon dive-bombs this scene and adds to the drama. You can afford to lose a little sleep to take this all in. And I did mention four planets, right? You'll find Saturn pretty much all on its own, well up in the southwest over on the other side of the sky as dawn approaches. But don't feel bad for the ringed wonder it will be the first of these planets to make an appearance in our evening sky. And the fifth bright planet, Mars, is still lingering low in the west after sunset, refusing to be swallowed up by twilight's glow. But August will be its last hurrah for this year. Speaking of the moon, here's a quick recap of its whereabouts. The month opens with first quarter on the first, followed by full moon on the ninth. Native Americans knew this as the full sturgeon moon, named for a freshwater fish that's found in lakes and rivers in North America. But it's also known as the barley moon, the grain moon, or fruit moon. Last, or third quarter moon, comes on the morning of the 16th, followed by new moon on August 23rd. 
Then the moon returns to the evening sky and reaches first quarter again just as we flip the calendar to September. Hey, have you ever wondered why full moons have names but new moons don't? We say the moon is new when it passes between Earth and the sun. Around those times, it gets thinner and harder to spot in the twilight glare before dawn and then just disappears from view for a couple of days before emerging in the evening sky. So, since we can't see the moon when it's new, I guess there was no point in giving it distinctive nicknames each month. Or we could start a new trend for these phases. The not there moon, the black as coal moon, and so forth. Have some fun with that. And please, let's avoid the clickbait that alerts you to supermoons, which I'm no fan of anyway, that happen at new moon. I even saw one website that trumpeted the occurrence of five new supermoons in a row this year. All of them hopelessly invisible, of course. Big whoop. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine August without thinking of the annual Perseid meteor shower. This is the time when you'll see many more shooting stars than usual. The Perseids have a fairly sharp peak, which this year is forecast for the night of August 12th and the pre-dawn hours of the 13th. You can start looking fairly soon after sunset, as early as 9 p.m., once the constellation Perseus rises over the northeastern horizon. The problem this year is that a fat, gibbous moon rises just as twilight is ending on the 12th. Its light will wash out the faintest Perseids, and you'll only see the brighter ones, which might come every 5 or 10 minutes. But keep an eye out for a couple of nights afterward, too. The moon will rise later, and you'll have more dark sky to work with. By the way, when the moon rises on the 12th, look for the planet Saturn about one fist to its right. Days later, the moon will be long gone from that part of the sky, but Saturn will still be there, getting a little higher after twilight, week by week. For a long time, no one knew what the Perseids were. Some Catholics believe that these meteors were the burning tears of St. Lawrence, who was martyred in Rome on August 10th in the year 258. Fast forward to 1837, when a Connecticut bookstore clerk named Edward Herrick saw lots of meteors on the night of August 9th, and he later concluded that they occur every year on the same date. It turns out that John Locke, the headmaster of a girls' school in Cincinnati, had reached the same conclusion three years earlier. Today we know that the Perseid meteors are bits of debris shed by a comet called Swift-Tuttle. Earth passes near the comet's orbit every August, and that's when tiny particles of comet dust, most the size of sand grains, slam into our atmosphere at 37 miles per second. All of this happens quite high above us, about 60 miles up. Each incoming particle compresses the thin air in front of it, like water just ahead of a speedboat, creating a white-hot shockwave along its path. The flash of light our eyes see is that brief but brilliant shockwave, not the particle itself burning up. Okay, let's do some stargazing. Turn towards south soon after nightfall and look for a fairly bright star not far above the southern horizon. That's Antares. It marks the heart of Scorpius, a critter whose head is marked by a vertical row of three medium-bright stars a little to the right. In the northern hemisphere, the closer you live to the equator, the higher up you'll see the scorpion in the sky. Those of you in southern states like Texas and Florida have much better views than I do way up here in Massachusetts. And from countries like Chile and Australia in the southern hemisphere, Scorpius appears directly overhead this time of year. Anyway, shift your gaze to the left of Antares by about three fists. You're looking for a group of eight medium-bright stars in the shape of a teapot. The handle is on the left, and the spout, tipped down a bit, is on the right. Got it? The whole thing is about the size of your clenched fist. From northern states in Europe, the teapot is only one or two fists above the horizon, so it helps if you look from a spot with a clear, unobstructed view towards south. Now, when astronomers carved up the sky, they didn't call this the teapot constellation. Instead, you found the main stars of the constellation Sagittarius, a mythological archer who is half man and half horse. And get this, you're looking toward the center of our home galaxy. 
if you're lucky enough to live where the sky is really dark, or if you happen to be on vacation in a rural setting, you'll see what look like puffs of steam rising from the spout. Those puffs mark the center of our Milky Way, which continues upward until it arches overhead and clear across the summer sky. And if you're unlucky enough to live where light pollution is rampant, which is unfortunately most of us, you can't see the Milky Way at all. In fact, ask yourself, have you ever seen the Milky Way in all its glory? If not, you really owe it to yourself to get out under a clear, deep black sky at this time of year to see all those stars arcing across the sky like a great river of light. It's a sight you won't soon forget. Do an about-face from Antares so that you're facing roughly north. After evening twilight fades, you'll see the Big Dipper hanging from its handle about halfway up in the sky. At the end of the handle are the four stars that form its bowl. Your outstretched fist will just cover the bowl. Now draw an imaginary line through the bottom pair of stars and follow that line upward and to the right by about three fists until you reach a medium bright star. That's the North Star, called Polaris, and you're now looking due north. Now go back to the dipper and this time follow the arc of its handle to the left until, three fifths away, you come to a bright star perched high above the western horizon. That's Arcturus, the fourth brightest star in the entire nighttime sky. And yet, as stars go, this one isn't much bigger or brighter than our own sun, but it is relatively close by, just 37 light years away. Arcturus is a Greek name meaning Guardian of the Bear, the constellation Ursa Major, which includes the Big Dipper. It's also the alpha star in the constellation Boötes, the plowman. The main stars of Boötes form a skinny, kite-shaped pattern about two-fifths tall that stretches to the upper right from Arcturus, which sits at the kite's bottom. Now look just to the kite's left, two-fifths directly above Arcturus. You're looking for a semicircle of stars, kind of shaped like a cup with no handle. This is a small, compact constellation called Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. You'll need a pretty dark sky to see the entire arc, but there is a medium bright star near its midpoint. That star is named Alfeca, which is Arabic for the bright star of the broken ring. And you might be wondering whether there's a southern counterpart called Corona Australis. Why, yes, there is, directly below the teapot of Sagittarius. But all of its stars are pretty faint, so don't be disappointed if you can't see it. That's about it for this month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, check out Sky at a Glance on our website, skyandtelescope.org, which offers great star and planet gazing activities on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, if you haven't already subscribed, you can find Sky Tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And please, leave a rating or a review. It'll help others to find it. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, please do check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and it's produced by me, Kelly Beattie. Join me next month when we'll go exploring in and around the Summer Triangle. Until then, I wish you clear skies.